NBC 34G. Uh, I'm substituting for Randy Speck on chair who's on vacation today. Uh, and let me uh, let the other uh, commissioners introduce themselves. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dan Bradfield. I represent 3G06, which is the district of Connecticut Avenue to the west. Connecticut Avenue towards uh, Friendship Heights. Hello, I'm Jerry Malix. I represent 3G05 uh, from Chevy Chase Circle down to about Military along Connecticut and over to um, Broad Branch. Good evening, everyone. I'm Shanda Tuck Garfield, and I represent ANC 34G02, which is on the westernmost part of the district near Oregon Avenue and Military Road. Thank you all for coming. Good evening, everyone. My name is Abraham Clayman, and I represent ANC 34G01, which is Hawthorne and part of Barnaby Woods. Good evening. Hello, I'm Rebecca Maynard at 34G04. I um, am Utah to Broad Branch, basically to Tennyson to Nebraska. I have Lafayette Elementary School and Lafayette Park, my single member district. I represent uh, 3G07, which is uh, the area south of military between Connecticut and Reno Road. Um, so we have uh, six commissioners here, which uh, forum is four, so we can conduct business today. So our first order of business is the adoption of the agenda, and I have two, two items to add to the agenda, both at the front, after community announcements. The first one is uh, Duncan Bedlian, the commander of the 2nd District, is here to say a few words for us. And uh, Robert Gordon from Little Beast is going to... Uh, we have a, a liquor license uh, renewal, so he'll come, and then after that, will be the discussion on 3615 Military Road. Uh, the only other thing I want to mention is uh, we have two rather long items, the uh, Oxford House item and uh, the item on uh, 5301 and 03 Connecticut Avenue. There's sign-up sheets for both of those if people want to speak. During this, uh, the speaking phase, uh, please sign up. The sheets are in the back corner, and you'll be uh, you'll be called in order if you sign up. Uh, okay, so we have a few community announcements here. I'll just go through this. Uh, are you going to vote on the agenda? What's that? Are you going to vote on? Oh, the that's agenda? right. We have to vote on the agenda. <laughs> that's Alan Beach. He's, he's our uh, commissioner uh, emeritus and part parliamentarian. So. Uh, uh, all in favor of the agenda, say aye. Okay, the agenda's passed. All right, uh, so uh, community announcements. So I have three announcements here. First one is the Public Service Commission will hold a town hall meeting on June 13th to discuss the final report from the MedSIS, Modernizing the Energy Delivery System for Increased Sustainability Working Groups. Uh, if you want more information, you can go onto their website. Number two, uh, Ingleside reaches a construction milestone this June 14th. Ingleside will complete work on the first major structure of the health services building. Residents will be able to use new assisted living residences, memory support assisted living, long-term care suites, rehabilitation suites, and medical services suite, and additional underground parking. So this is a big thing for Ingleside. And the two independent living buildings in the Center for Healthy Living are on schedule for completion by the end of 2019. And finally, I'd like to mention that former U.S. Congressman Don Frazier passed away earlier this month. You may or may not remember that Congressman Frazier put the ANC provisions into the D.C. Home Rule, home rule Bill. He wanted D.C. to try an experiment of, gla of grassroots democracy, which means then participation at a very local level. So you'll, you can decide today whether he was smart or not. Alan, do you have any uh, other comments on this? I know no, you. With the full meeting, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Uh, next, uh, Commander Duncan Bedlin, Bedlin can you, uh, wait a minute, I forgot the commissioner announcements. I'm a little new to this. <laughs> okay, do you have any commissioner announcements? Anybody? Oh, maybe that's why I skipped it over. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Bedlin. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Duncan Bedley, and I came here earlier this year when I took over in the 2nd District. And for those of you that were there, you 
may have recalled that we were experiencing a surge in property crime related to thefts from autos, where cars are broken into and items are stolen. And uh, I want to come here tonight and tell you that we've made significant progress and report to you some of the things that have occurred. So in December of 2018, just to give you a snapshot of where, what we were dealing with when I came over, we had 274 cars that were broken into in the second district. January 240. Well, in April and in May, we have dropped our numbers uh, almost in half. We're at 138 for April and 128 for May. And uh, currently, June, we're trending on that same uh, standard of, of a drop at about un under 150. And uh, that is consistent with the crime trends in previous years. And one of the things that we've done is we have implemented a robust uh, working dialogue with Montgomery County and Chevy Chase Police and the 4th District as well. So Military Road uh, going east runs into the 4th District. And the commander there is Randy Griffin. And he and I see each other multiple times a week and we talk regularly about people that are using Military Road to commit crimes to and from our borders in the 2nd and 4th District. So the 2nd District, your officers that represent you, they have gone out and made 28 arrests related to theft from autos since January of this year. And for those of you that don't know, theft from auto arrests are very, very hard to catch. There's limited forensics. They're very quick. How many of you have seen one in progress in the city? So you know they happen everywhere, but you don't see it. They're, they're, in, they're in covert, dark areas at night. They're quick. And our officers have done a dedicated investigative approach, and we've had those 20 arrests, and they're making a big difference. So that's the update I wanted to share with you all. And I also want to applaud the community as well, because we also responded with a big awareness push to remind folks to take your belongings, take your keys, and lock your car doors. And folks are doing that. We're seeing an improvement in that. And we did a community walk on Saturday, uh, excuse me, on Sunday, with uh, Montgomery County Chevy Chase, around the Chevy Chase Circle, and along Connecticut Avenue. And I think we're gonna to continue to build those relationships and they're the key to preventing this crime. I just wanna share that update with you and take questions. You allow? Any questions from the commissioners? Questions from the audience? Dan, that was on Sunday. I have been more willing to do that, the better off I think we are. The joint community, not only top jurisdictional, but the more that we can bring in uh, community into that process, I think that's going to solve. I know a couple officers were out kind of hitting the streets and inviting people, you know, in the past few days. Um, I would love to promote even more so we could get a little more. That, that would be great because I would love, you know, we have a communication system in process now, in place now, and the more we can show that out, I, I would love dozens now to participate in the same thing. Absolutely, thank you. And if, if you have a, an area in your neighborhood that you'd like us to participate in a walk, just let us know. We have a very active community outreach civilian. Her name is Ms. Kaye Branch. You can email me or you can also email your uh, PSA and sector officials. You have Captain Edward Burnett. In PSA 201, you have Lieutenant Eric, Edward Aragona. Anybody from the audience have a question? Thank Commander, you. thank you very much. I appreciate you. you coming by and taking time out of your sick Okay, uh, this is your Yeah, this, this should be fairly quick. Uh, we have had already uh, on the agenda a couple of times and had to be moved for varying reasons. An alcohol renewal license, Simpson Class, Opera 10991. It's for uh, Robert Gordon Group, Chevy Chase, and for the Little Beast. And Robert, do you want to, uh, do you want to come up and say something? Uh, we have the hours that are stand as we're agreed to uh, in the MOU, and everything will be fine with no complaints. It must be here tonight. So, Robert, do you want to Hello, everybody. My name is Robert Gordon. I'm uh, one of the partners in a family-owned restaurant called uh, Little Beast Bistro. Uh, I recognize some of the faces who have participated there, gone there, enjoyed it. Uh, it's a family restaurant. We serve pizza, uh, other dishes. Uh, we, um, our hours are typically from 5 until 11, which is well within our memorandum of understanding allows us to stay open to one, what we find in this neighborhood, 
one o'clock is uh, way beyond most people's uh, time to go to uh, a restaurant. Uh, in uh, the last, we, have, we started operating in October last year. Uh, the, thing, the main things that have occurred that, that would potentially be um, considered as part of the liquor license is that we, uh, we, we have a deck. We had a permit for that originally. Since then, we put on an awning, and we have now brunches on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, inside on Thursday evenings from uh, 8 to um, 11, I believe, we have a three-piece uh, jazz band uh, there inside that the noise is, there's no sound or music outside. Uh, other than that, we're operating in a very standard uh, professional fashion. The, uh, every once in a while I do a, a sound check outside at the decimal meter. And I check to see that we're in compliance and we always are. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anybody that has any concerns or would like to speak? That being the case, uh, I'd like to bring you to the vote. I make the recommendation that Opera 109091 Class C license for Little Beast Gordon Restaurant Group Chevy Chase. Um, the Alan, how do we move to support? He is supported. Second, thank you. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, the next uh, item is uh, Mr. Mallet's design discussion and possible vote. Right. Let, me, uh, let me back up here. I haven't done this for about two years. Uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to get through this because we we've got a action pack uh, meeting. So uh, any uh, representatives from the mayor's office here tonight want to say anything? Representatives of uh, Ward 3 and Ward 4? Gabrielle, okay. Gabrielle is here. Gabrielle. Okay, come on. Oh, Gabrielle. She stepped out. She'll be back. Yeah. Gabrielle, we're ready for your uh, meeting and now your presentation. Sorry about that. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, I am uh, one of the Ward 4 liaison, um, sorry, one of the Ward 4 representatives in the Mayor's Office of Community Relations and Services. Uh, hopefully this will be the last week that I do not have business cards, so I just want to take a quick minute to share with you all my contact information. Uh, so my phone number is 202-603-7182. Again, that is 202 603 7182. And my email address is Gabrielle, spelled G A B R I E L L E, dot P R I E S T, that's priest, two at dc.gov. The two is just a number, it's not spelled out. I just have a few updates to share with you all. So, sorry, let me lower this. Uh, last week, Mayor Bowser announced the creation of the Mayor's Commission on Healthcare Systems. Uh, while, while Washington, D.C. is home to seven acute care hospitals that offer world-renowned services, residents still face challenges in access, access, accessing sorry, critical services. The Commission's work will focus on alleviating these challenges by developing recommendations that addresses the current stresses in the district's health care system, while specifically targeting the following issues, improving access to primary, acute, and specialty care services, including behavioral health care, addressing health system capacity issues for inpatient, outpatient, pre-hospital and emergency room services, and promoting an equitable geographic distribution of acute care and specialty services in communities east of the Anacostia River. The Commission on Healthcare Systems Transformation will be composed of 27 members, uh, bringing together the best and brightest to facilitate partnerships between the district and the people who see and do this work every day. 
The commission, which will be co-chaired by former at-large council member David Catania and Sister Carol Kean, President and Chief of sorry, Chief Executive Officer of the Catholic Health Association of the United States, will develop their recommendations over the next six months and then present them to Mayor Bowser later this year. Uh, additionally, Mayor Mario Bowser has proposed the Safe Cannabis Sales Act of 2019, legislation allowing for the sale of recreational cannabis in Washington, D.C. The bill enhances public health and safety, provides clarity on the use of cannabis and cannabis products, and advances equity to ensure that the benefits of the new re regime to go to D.C.'s most vulnerable communities through jobs and investments in housing. Revenues collected on cannabis will be invested back into the community, focusing on the areas most hit most hardest by the criminalization of marijuana. Uh, earlier today, Mayor, B Mayor Bowser and Eagle Bank President and Chief of Executive Officer Susan G. Rail announced an exclusive mortgage loan option program designed to help DC government employees achieve home ownership in d the District of Columbia. Uh, the announcement comes ahead of the 11th annual DC Housing Expo and Show, which is going to be uh, Saturday, June 15th, which is co-hosted by the Department of Housing and Community Development and the Greater, League, Greater Washington Urban League, an all-day event focused on sharing housing resources to ensure that residents of all backgrounds can afford to live and thrive in the city. Um, the special mortgage program will offer a, a substantial discount on the interest rates for various mortgage loans, including conventional federal housing, uh, conventional federal housing administration, home equity lines of credit, and FHA rehabs. Borrowers do not have to be first-time home buyers, and all DC government employees are eligible, and no tenure requirement. Uh, other features of the program include the Bank at Work deposit program and home buying education seminars. Ready? I do have a few minutes or a few minutes for questions, correct? Yeah. Okay. Do you have any questions? Okay, well I just I just want to share my phone number one more time in case uh, anyone missed it. That is 202-603-7182. Right. Thank you. Okay, uh, I see Jackson here. You want to say anything? Okay. I want to, I want, I want to welcome up Council Member Randy Todd. Thank you, Commissioner, and I'll be brief. And uh, Jackson does a fantastic job at representing me, but I thought since I was here that perhaps I should uh, just say a quick few words. Uh, thank you, one, to all of the commissioners for the work you do, but certainly Commissioners Maydak. Uh, Clayman and Tuck Garfield for working so closely with myself and my staff on quality of life issues uh, that affect Ward 4. As you know, the council, we had our second vote on our city's $15.5 billion budget. Uh, two weeks ago, we have made unprecedented investments uh, in affordable housing, uh, the creation of a new middle income uh, housing tax credits to support uh, developers who develop middle income housing uh, to provide more supports to um, individuals who work for governments like DC government, teachers, firefighters, uh, and et cetera, to take advantage of uh, the ability to live and work uh, in the District of Columbia. I'm really thrilled that we are making huge investments in infrastructure. I think one of the top things I hear uh, from this community is roadways, streets, sidewalks, tree trim alleys. And I'm really thrilled that uh, the council and the mayor, we are investing about $500 million uh, in, the, in our six year, uh, four year financial plan to make huge investments uh, in those areas. And uh, we have put um, about uh, several million dollars uh, per ward uh, to make those investments. So I'm very, very excited about that. As it relates to seniors, uh, as you know, I have created two programs that will help uh, seniors to be able to age in place and live in their homes. One is a senior dental uh, care program that will be run by the District Department of Health uh, that will help seniors fill the gap in their health care regimen uh, to get free diagnostic uh, dental care, uh, which would be available to any senior with a household income under $100,000. I also introduced and funded legislation that would provide a $500 rebate for seniors who also 
uh, have a household income under $100,000 or $100,000 or less uh, to get a $500 rebate for a hearing aid. That's one thing I've heard uh, from a number of World War seniors is the ability uh, to, to afford uh, a hearing aid. Also, as you know, uh, in July, I'm very hopeful that we will break ground uh, on a brand new uh, field house at Lafayette uh, Field. Uh, that'll be about a $5 million investment. Currently, there's the field house that's about 500 square feet. We'll have about a 2,500 square foot facility that I think will really com complement uh, this community quite nicely. Uh, we are also working very closely with the community and the Friends of Lafayette Park and the ANC uh, to have a robust storm water management uh, plan uh, for the Lafayette field as we move to uh, rehab that. And that will be about an a $800,000 investment. Uh, and so we're very, very um, excited about that. I've received uh, some emails to my office and I've seen uh, correspondence on the Chevy Chase listserv around the status of the Episcopal Center. Um, I've been in touch with them. As you may or may not know, this Friday, uh, they will end uh, their school program there. Um, however, uh, they will have a fully functioning board of directors. They will also have their executive staff will remain there as well as uh, facilities maintenance and management. Uh, I have been on good authority from the executive director that they have no plans on uh, leaving that site. They are just restructuring uh, what they're doing there and they have decided to close the school. Uh, I was told that this happened probably in the 1950s or so. But as we learn more from the Episcopal Center, we'll be sure to keep the ANC uh, up to date as well as um, neighbors. But you can rest assured that the building will not be for sale, uh, certainly not in the imminent future. Uh, they will have a fully functioning board of directors who's looking at what the next best course of action is for the Episcopal Center and the, the building will be maintained uh, by their facility staff. They will have their executive staff there each and every day uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, I could probably talk for 30 more minutes, but I don't have that much time. I'm happy to take any questions or concerns. I know there are a number of neighbors here uh, around uh, the uh, Oxford House issue, uh, and so I know that I'll be here as well as representatives from agencies in the government. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions. If anybody has any quick questions, suggestions, or perhaps anything I didn't cover. Okay. Yes, sir, any questions? Anybody from the public? Thank you very much, John. And I did want to acknowledge Jackson Carnes, my constituent director, who comes here uh, each month uh, on, my, on my behalf. And I'm also joined by my chief of staff, Cheryl Hobson, this evening. Thank you very much. Appreciate, appreciate you coming. Uh, anybody from uh, Council Member Che's office wants to talk? Anybody else from the mayor's office? OK, I think we're done. Uh, one other uh, city official I want to recognize, that's the director of ECRA, Ernest Chapra, stand up and say, he'll be here for uh, the two large items. Anybody else from the city that wants to be introduced? Okay. Right here. Uh, this next item is a possible vote on a special exception application for 3615 Military Road for uh, an existing bump out to go beyond where it is right now. So now's the time. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Zidane. My wife and I are homeowners at 3615 Military Road. We're seeking a special special exception relief tonight for widening of an existing bump out on the first floor. We're doing that project to um, reconfigure, modernize our current kitchen. Um, the reason why it's a special exception is the existing bump out encroaches four feet onto the side yard, which would be a required eight feet. Um, Probably a good way to describe this. I do have a bunch of drawings that I have this easel too. I can hand these out to everyone. I only have 11 copies. Yeah. I also have Leroy Johnson, four brothers who did the 
trying to really you guys want to take easel as well? Sorry, would you like an easel? No, you're good. Um, so I think as you see the drawings handed out, um, they are in keeping with the architecture of the house, also in keeping with um, similar uh, additions in the neighborhood. Um, we have a very large mature garden in the front yard, which shields the addition from the street. There will be no changes to that garden with uh, plans. No trees will be harmed. Um, and lastly, most importantly, our next door neighbors immediately adjacent. We talked with them, showed them the plans. They have no objections. I have a letter from them stating that. And we also have uh, neighbors across the street who also sent us a letter stating no objections. And I have copies of all those letters. Any questions for me? Okay. You can give us a copy of the letter. Questions from the commissioners? I just want to make sure to clarify one thing. Thank you, Steve, for yeah, sure. trying to prevent. It, it seems from the drawing that there's already a bump out that is four feet from the property line. Correct. And you want to essentially bring some of that forward. So there's a little bit more of a bump out, but it's still four feet. Still four feet, yeah. We're not encroaching on any more on the side yard. Right. It's already encroaching. Already four feet, yes. Right. Got it. Okay. Thank and you. And that, the neighbor on that side is no that's the neighbor, the neighbor, like, you know, the pictures looking at our house, those are the neighbors that had no problems with it. All right, uh, one of the letters that he passed out was from 3613 Military Road, and that's the property that's adjacent to yours. Yes. And that's the only one because you're on the street. We're on the corner of right. Judges Parkway, but the, the neighbors immediately sort of across us on Military Road also sent a letter, and they have a view of our house. Right. And there's nothing in the alley that's up against you. So. It's just 3630. Yep. Could I ask what year this house was built? Uh, 1918. So it was built prior to the 1958 code. That's what I wanted to know. Any other questions? Okay. Gary, you want to motion on this one? Sure. Um, I'd like to propose that we, uh, Alan, is it? Support. Support. We support the special exception application for 3615 Military Road, easy case number 20060. Second. Second. Okay, thank you. Oh, who's going to go down and participate? What's the name? I'm not sure we need it. We support it. We don't have to participate, do we? You may want to make somebody in case it's needed. Well, <laughs> do you have a date that you're going to be in front of the board? Okay. Uh, you'll let me know when you have a date? Okay. Thank you. Okay. So now we're... Uh, we're up to uh, discussion of concerns raised about leases of 745 900 Moreland Street. Thank you, Commissioner Property. Um, so as you know, tonight we have many residents here, and I thank you all for coming, as well as Councilmember Todd and um, the various agencies in the city, as well as the Oxford House. Um, an issue has arisen in our neighborhood, which um, residents brought to our attention in April, and this issue is dealing with um, housing in our communities. And so, as you know, housing is an important issue to all of us here in the And our ANC, as the grassroots organization, um, the first level of government, I would say, is here to both look at the residents' concerns as well as to um, ensure that the residents of um, Oxford House also get fair and equal treatment for housing. And so it's within that light that we come tonight to have this issue discussed. And tonight's agenda, and it's been given 45 minutes, and this, as you know, this is the first meeting for it, and I'll give you some background. This by no means means that this would be perhaps the only meeting for this issue, because we do realize that sometimes 45 minutes is not enough. But at least it will begin the dialogue in an open forum so that we can know 
one um, just about more about the issue, um, more about Oxford Homes, more about the agencies and the rights of residents here in the district. And it will begin this on that road. And so we will also be able to hear from residents who have raised a number of questions via email. And, and we've all been talking about this since April, and that's when it first came to my attention. And at that time, I reached out to Council Member Todd, who's here tonight, as well as the agencies, and raised several questions regarding the issue. And just a little bit of background regarding it. Um, there are two homes on Moreland Street, we have the ad addresses on the agenda, that were leased out by a private owner to the Oxford Home Facility, which is a new facility, at least in our neighborhood, but not in the United States. No, um, it's not new here. Right, it's not new here, as Commissioner Mur Murtis Beach is pointing out. Um, and so at that time, uh, there are a number of questions in terms of what are the residents' um, rights to notice, you know, when individuals come into the community, um, it, or organizations such as this, and also what are the occupancy issues that are arising, and as well as um, other things dealing with the lease. So with that, I reached out to Council Member Todd, who's here tonight, and he'll give you more background on it. We're also going to hear from the agencies, um, and I want the residents to know that you know, we do hear your concerns and we do hear your questions and this is very important to us and that we just want to ensure that everyone gets an opportunity to speak and that also that everyone, no matter what your background, you get a fair and equal treatment in terms of housing. So on that note, I'll turn it over to Council Member Todd. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Tuck Garfield. And as your uh, commissioner has said, well, first I want to thank uh, your commissioner for really being a partner uh, with my office around this issue over the last couple of months. Um, it, as Commissioner Tuck Garfield noted, uh, it was brought to my office's attention as well as to her office's attention uh, that two homes on Moreland Street were being leased out by a private homeowner to Oxford House, uh, which provides uh, um, residents for individuals who are in recovery. Um, we currently have, I believe, eight Oxford homes in our ward uh, and two that have located on Moreland Street. There have been a number um, of questions uh, from neighbors around the density uh, concerns, which I think uh, is probably one of the chief concerns is the number of individuals that will live uh, in, in either house. Um, and to that end, I've asked uh, both the Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs, uh, as well as the Department of De Behavioral Health, uh, to join me this evening uh, in an effort to walk uh, neighbors through what our current law allows, uh, how each of the agencies represented this evening has uh, uh, an effect over what can and cannot happen as it relates to uh, homes such as Oxford homes. Now, this is so many of you maybe have a group home or have heard of group homes. This is not a group home. We have our certainly our fair share of group homes in Ward 4 across all 20 neighborhoods. Um, I think our ward is probably very desirable for group homes because large homes on large lots. Um, but this isn't a group home. Uh, it is, and we'll, we'll uh, let the DBH explain more about uh, how we've seen Oxford houses uh, operate in different parts of the city. Uh, I think at the end of the conversation this evening, I want to make sure that uh, neighbors have a very clear understanding of what we can do from the government's perspective and what we cannot do. Uh, so one thing that I'm going to ask the Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs to discuss uh, is our zoning regulations which defines a household. So the, the two homes, uh, the aforementioned homes, uh, will house, one will house eight individuals and the other will house nine individuals. And I'm going to ask Director Shrapa uh, to talk about DCRA's process um, as it relates to uh, reasonable accommodations uh, and, and what that process looks like. So, Director, if you would just join me, um, as well as Dr. Uh, Azron from the Department of Behavioral Health, we'll have uh, Director Shrapa go first, uh, and then uh, Dr. Azron. And then we're happy to take any questions, and all questions are okay. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. 
So current in, in addition to regulation, a household is defined as six individuals who are related. If there are more than six individuals who are unrelated, they have to apply for a special accommodation uh, from the consumer and regulatory affairs. There are, the number of individuals that would be in either uh, Oxford home is eight and 10. Are you saying 10? Nine and 10, nine and 10, pardon me. Good evening, everyone. Um, speaking directly to the zoning requirement here, um, the zoning requirement is six, and clearly two houses that are in the subject of this conversation exceeds that number. That said, there is a process to um, go through um, with respect to reasonable accommodation for fair housing reasons, uh, ADA reasons, and uh, a litany of other reasons. Currently, Oxford House has applied for that reasonable accommodation, and we are going through the process of evaluating the application to make a decision. With respect to timeline, we make a decision in 30 days. So they applied on June 4th, and in 30 days, we'll make a decision one way or the other. but what I would like to do is have a, a fair process. First, let's gather the information, right? right I, I, we hear you. Wait, wait, wait. I know. I know, no, I know that, and that's a, it's, it's true. It's true, and that's what we want to provide you here tonight. We want to provide accurate information. We want to provide a fair opportunity for everyone to be heard. So the way we're going to proceed tonight is first, they're going to present us with the information. And then we have a sign-up sheet, and if you have questions, then our agency generally gives individuals time to ask the questions and to make their comments. And I appreciate your comment, because I'm a resident, and I live on Moreland Street, too. You guys know my address, 5649 Moreland Street. So I'm here, and I'm down the street, and I'm there. So I'm with you. So let's have that, because at this point, we have 45 minutes to get the information out. And then from there, if we do not have enough time tonight, we will have a second meeting that focuses solely on the issue for the residents. But this is just to get us the information out because I know there have been a number of emails, there's been good information, and there's been some misinformation. So we want to correct that tonight by telling us, as the council member said, what the law is. And let's start from there. Thank you. And then I will also note that we have been joined Paul Malloy, and we're going to ask Mr. Malloy uh, to join us uh, in questions as well. I will say that to your question, is your crystal right? Is that your yeah. name? Yes. And when you have a question, you can just state your name or at least your, or where you live, which right. you live on. Um, Director uh, sent a letter to Oxford House notifying them that they were to apply for accommodation. I have since sent a letter to the director asking him that while this is under his agency's consideration that the law be enforced that there be no more than six individuals per household i'm not sure i think we just sent that letter maybe today so i don't know that i haven't responded yet so i'm gonna give the agency an opportunity to respond i've also requested that the agency consider taking community concern so hearing from neighbors um, Hearing direct, have the ability to hear directly from neighbors. So there it will be a comment period, uh, and I will work with your commissioner to in, and on the email list that we have to make sure uh, that we give you the uh, information to let you know who you would send uh, your note to the Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs um, to as it relates to the Oxford House. Uh, one thing, just uh, we have a, a standard ANC procedure. It's the first that presenters get to present and the commissioners can answer, ask questions and then citizens 
from the audience to, to ask questions, and we have a list, so there, you, you can ask in order. So I please no to speaking out of turn, uh, or we'll be here all night. Thank you. Is this an uh, opportunity to go about the overview of the agency? Yes. yes. All right. Okay. Um, someone will have to remind me what specifically I have to address now. Well, okay. okay. Uh, also, what else came to our attention, I believe, in uh, the end of May, I just don't recall the exact date, but uh, Councilmember Todd has taken a leadership role in uh, asking the executive branch agencies to respond to community interest, and I believe we've done so appropriately. One of the things that we have to be mindful of whenever there is a complaint or there is a compliment or there is a concern is to respect due process. Um, the way the law is structured, one misstep could undermine the case. So once we receive the concerns with respect to Oxford House, we immediately look at the existing law, the regulatory uh, provisions, and this on fact finding. As a result of that, we sent a letter to Oxford House with respect to what we see as violations or issues with uh, zoning code compliance. And he clearly stated that given their circumstance and given the number of people in the building, it exceeded the six that is uh, allowed. And due process warrants that we give them an opportunity to respond and at the same time lay out the process that they can respond. That resulted in a letter being uh, sent to them detailing out the process to ask for reasonable accommodation. Once we received that, we reviewed it and we are following our standard timeline here where we will make a decision in 30 days. So from June 4th to fast forward to July 4th, it's our period to do all the um, research we can, coordinate with our sister agencies to understand the magnitude of issues understand the impact where residents could be displaced, understand the use process rights that we have to uh, uh, protect, and also understand the history of litigation, because the district was in a, a consent uh, uh, decree arrangement with Oxford House, uh, and we have to factor that all into our decision-making process. So the net net of all of this is that I expect to not only hear from DCRA with respect to our decision by July 4th, it's a holiday, so Fireworks can come up at that point as well. But at the same time, you have an opportunity to participate and inform us about your concerns in a way that is actually helpful. We have a streamlined process where we weigh community input. Uh, some of you already met Agnes uh, Sakite, she's uh, the liaison dedicated to this area, so that's another channel. But once this meeting is um, over, I'll be happy to spend a few minutes to discuss how DCRA will be looking out for neighbors on both sides of this issue. Thank you. Stop, director. Um, regarding the 30-day notice, is the agency going to have an opportunity to comment within that 30-day period? Yes, certainly. Um, between now and when we make our decision, uh, the ANC is very welcome, and I encourage the uh, ANC to take um, some position on this issue to inform our thinking uh, but what we are really looking for is some equitable solution. Uh, and the way we get there is for us to recognize that we have to be good neighbors, regardless of our needs or business models. And the solution is not going to come by litigating the court. That's expensive for everybody. The solution has to be practical and it has to be forward looking as well. So we look forward for the opportunity to get input from the ANC as well as uh, neighbors who are in this room as well. The director Chopra, forgive me, am I saying your name correctly? Yes. Chopra? Yes. Okay. Um, you mentioned reasonable accommodation. Can you talk a little bit more about what you meant? Yeah, and I, I wish I went to law school. I didn't. I went to business school. So uh, the way the lawyers have described it is um, in the context of, um, let's say, disability. Uh, so let's say I can use sort of like an employment scenario to uh, uh, lay it out to the best degree that I can. Let's say somebody has to work uh, behind a computer and for some reason uh, they can't see the computer screen clearly or the chair that they are sitting in creates some problem. They'll have to talk uh, to um, somebody within like you know, HR for other measures to be taken to make sure that they can function uh, uh, properly uh, given the circumstance and their rights are not trampled upon. 
in the case of our hotspot house in this uh, particular situation, uh, the residents or the nature of their function bring some protected class issues, whether it's race, it's ethnicity, it's, there's a whole bunch of things that go into it. So we have to be cognizant about what our zoning regulations would mean in the context of reasonable accommodation. And they, by law, have that right to ask for a reasonable accommodation. Just as the neighbor is here asking for an exception to be done uh, with respect to BZA, I mean, that's just due process. So we are evaluating all those factors so that we can make an informed decision. Good evening, everyone. I'm Barbara Bashron. I'm the um, acting director of the Department of Behavioral Health. And I have to say that, you know, we have had a very positive partnership with the Oxford Houses uh, over the years. Oxford Houses have been within the District of Columbia for over 13 years. And during that time, actually, this is the first complaint that we've had. In most instances, um, the Oxford House residents are good neighbors in all instances, of the, you know, and there aren't any disruptions and so forth. It is a nationally recognized model. There are Oxford Houses, over 2,400 uh, around the country, and I've actually worked with Oxford Houses, not just here in the district, but also in the state of Maryland, uh, and uh, they are extremely successful. They have one of the highest recovery rates of clean and sober living uh, facilities in the country. So uh, that is one of the reasons why we were interested in supporting uh, this particular model. I want to say on the outset that Oxford Houses is a recovery model. It is not a treatment model. And so what that means is that uh, the Department of Behavioral Health really works then to ensure that people are connected to care. Uh, through our resource specialists who are funded with some grant dollars that we have uh, made available to us. We also help individuals who are new to Oxford House Living uh, in paying the first three months of their rent. And that gives them an opportunity to do job seeking, to get settled uh, in, in the community, and begin a life so that they can be productive citizens within their uh, communities. We work extremely closely with the Oxford Houses. Our staff uh, talks to o o Oxford House staff at least every other month. We go out and we visit the houses to make sure uh, that they're in good uh, working order. And I must emphasize the fact that this is independent living. What that means is that we don't have staff living on site within the Oxford Houses. It is self-regulated by the members. However, their rules are extremely, extremely strict. There are no alcohol, no drugs of any kind in the house. If any of that is found, the person is ejected from the house immediately. And uh, uh, Mr. Malloy can really share a little bit more with respect to the manner in which uh, the houses are operated. Uh, we receive monthly reports on the programmatic aspects, uh, making sure that people are connected, that training occurs, not just with the individuals who are in care there, who are living there, but also with the staff to make sure that uh, uh, that information is provided in terms of care coordination, case management activities, and other related uh, requirements for, from the District of Columbia. So I want to really stop there and turn it over to the individuals who know this model best, uh, Mr. Malloy and his staff, who can talk in detail about the manner in which the program operates. But once again, we do not license the facilities. We provide grant funding to support the services and make sure that individuals in early recovery have a safe, drug-free environment to live in. Hi, uh, my name is Paul Malloy, and I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. Uh, I've been sober now for 44 years, thanks to my wife. 
had me committed in 1975 to a mental institution and divorced me, and we were divorced for 13 years. She held a grudge for a long time. Now we've been remarried for 30 years. The first Oxford house started in Silver Spring, Maryland, when Montgomery County closed what was a halfway house. And the 13 of us living there took it over to run ourselves. And we organized in chows of democracy, electing officers, voting on things. I'm from Vermont, and we kind of based it on the Vermont town meeting. In my drinking days in the 60s, I worked for Senator Winston Crowdy from Vermont. And we fought very hard for many years, finally successful in eliminating the commissioner system in the District of Columbia and letting democracy be shared by the citizens of the District of Columbia. And 60, 70 years ago, I didn't think that one day I would be here able to witness it firsthand. <laughs> However, I am. When we opened that first house, the first thing we did was eliminate any time limit because the county had a six month time limit. And once you were there six months, you had to leave. Your time was up. In the first three months I was there, 11 guys had to leave. 10 of them were back using drugs and booze within 30 days. So for purely selfish reasons, first thing we did with Oxford House is said you could live there as long as you want, as long as you don't drink, you don't use drugs, and you pay your equal share of household expenses. That model worked so well that we felt guilty after a while because nobody was relapsing. We had no vacancies. We had all kinds of people asking to come in. And so we rented our second house in the District of Columbia, 4400 Pessenden Street, Northwest. Then we rented a house in 1976 at Northampton, Connecticut. Right just there. across the street. Right and that way. Yes, okay. <laughs> and that house, when we rented it, the Neighborhood Association was concerned. That was before the Federal Fair Housing Act. That was 1976. And I met with the uh, folks in the association and said that I knew the mayor very well. It was Mary and Mary. We did work in recovery again. And I said, I bet I could go talk to Mary and Barry because at that point, in 1976, there was not a single group home west of Rock Creek Park. For some reason, all those old city commissioners and other folks stuck everything in Anacostia and down in that neck of the woods. And we convinced Mrs. McCarthy who owned that house that she should rent it for us, and she did. And that was an Oxford house in 1976 until, what was it, 2010? Approximately. Yeah, 2010, the third generation of McCarthy's wanted to sell the house, and so we said, okay, we'll move. When Mrs. McCarthy died, she left the house to her two daughters, and she said, continue to rent it as an Oxford house, because those are great guys. And uh, we are proud of that. As a matter of fact, we're so proud of it that, that Congress learned about us. 1988 and stuck a provision in the Anti-Drug Abuse Act saying, we think those people in the District of Columbia are so smart because there's 13 Oxford houses that we should share that with other states. And so now there's 2,600 Oxford houses all around the country in 45 states. And the interesting thing about Oxford House is that 80% of the folks who move in stay clean and sober. You may think that's terrible, 20% fail. Well, the normal failure rate is 80%. If you go to Bay Ford, if you go to Hazleton, if you go to any other treatment place, your odds of staying clean and sober are one in five. If you get into Oxford House, somehow it works. We like to think it works because we brag about being good neighbors and good neighbors. There's a house on Garrison Street over behind Gallers. It's been there since 1980. Those guys, year in and year out, keep replenishing the stock. They vote people in. It takes an 80% vote to get into the house. It takes just one drink, one use of drugs for your peers to meet and throw you out. Each house elects five officers, a president, a secretary, a treasurer, a controller, so you've always got somebody to deal with in that house. Each house gets its own FBI in number, the IRS. Each house sets up its own bank. And that autonomous stuff, I maybe picked it up from Crowley. He said the people in the District of Columbia should have autonomy. 
but we stick to it. Each house really is autonomous. People vote, they behave. In Congress, among other things, passed the Federal Fair Housing Act that said you couldn't discriminate against the handicap. And we argued that recovering alcohol once a drug had its qualified as handicap. That case reached the Supreme Court. Now I'm going to turn it over to Steve Poland to talk a little bit about what the law is because Steve went to federal prison, worked at the Justice Department, sold cocaine back in the 80s, he got caught, the FBI got him, he got convicted, he went to jail for what, two years? He only served 22 months, but for two years he was there. He came out and got into an officer house. And we got ourselves a guy who understood the law from the inside and the outside. And he set a precedent in the District of Columbia X-ray Poland says the District of Columbia was the only jurisdiction at the time who said if you commit a felony and you then are rehabbed, we'll let you take the bar. They did, and Steve did, and passed. And one of those cases that we had around the country about not in my backyard reached the U.S. Supreme Court. Steve, tell us about the law. I told the story. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, it was a DEA nothing. We need to keep this about five minutes. Yeah. Uh, real quick, and, and Director Chavez referenced the uh, Federal Fair Housing Act. Could you move closer to the microphone? The District of Columbia has a Human Rights Act which tracks the Federal Fair Housing Act. Uh, Federal Fair Housing Act uh, says that you can't discriminate against people with handicaps, and the subcategory of people with handicaps are recovering addicts and alcoholics. And one of the things Congress did when they amended the act was they put a reasonable accommodation provision in. The reasonable accommodation provision imposes a duty upon the District of Columbia to grant our reasonable accommodation request unless it shows, um, unless they can demonstrate that there, it, 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 it fundamentally alters their zoning scheme. So this is not the district's first rodeo with the Fair Housing Act. And it's not their first rodeo with Oxford House. Uh, back in the mid-90s, uh, the district was sued by the Justice Department on behalf of Oxford House and two other housing providers in the District of Columbia. There was a consent decree. Oh, let me back up. Part, part of the information you need to understand as to why the reasonable accommodation uh, uh, has a different twist to it in the District of Columbia is because the definition of family or household in the district is up to six unrelated persons or one of the other categories is up to 15 members of a religious community. As part of the uh, consent decree, which was entered into in 1995, the District of Columbia had a grant Oxford House's reasonable accommodation request and allow Oxford House to have up to 15 people because the zoning code allowed up to 15 people, regardless of whether, it, I mean, mainly because it, it's religious, but if they're doing it for people of uh, faith, clergy, they have to do it for the handicapped. And that's why there was no fundamental alteration. Uh, the term of the uh, consent decree was for three years, but the language of the consent decree says, thereafter, the district may change the accommodation only if, in its judgment, there has been a change in circumstances affecting the intended purpose of Oxford House or to comply with the change in applicable federal law. There hasn't been a change in federal law uh, since 1995, and there hasn't been any change in the Oxford House model since 1995. So it's sort of unfortunate that Councilman Todd felt it necessary to send DCRA a letter uh, saying that uh, we had that, that DCRA was going to make Oxford House reduce its population to six. Because there's another provision in the Fair Housing Act, uh, which I call the retaliation uh, section. So once federal federal once the federal rights of the Oxford House is asserted, which it was asserted in the letter to DCRA, this section kicks in. 
uh, and you can't retaliate, interfere, or harass, or coerce uh, someone in the exercise of their fair housing act. Uh, I know, and I, I thank you, and I know we... The microphone's being cut yes. off. <laughs> um, we appreciate your giving us the background for that. We do need a little bit more time. Well, that time is unfortunately, and now we have time for, for the commissioner questions and the books of residents. So as we mentioned, by no means, this is perhaps our last discussion on this, but for tonight, I'm sorry we have to move on. Yes, I was just saying that we have to move on to the next piece. Okay, I thought... Oh, and the commissioner questions. The commissioner questions is first, then we'll take okay, questions from the audience. Uh, I have two things. Uh, I think you've probably touched on this, but I'm just... I spent a fair amount of time here on your president's website, the Oxford House website, and one of the things under zoning, it says, Oxford Houses are not subject to zoning laws regulating the number of unrelated individuals who may live in a single family dwell. I think that's what you were trying to get at when you were talking. But if that's the truth, then what are we reviewing? Uh, why is CCRA reviewing this? Yeah, we, there have been a number of cases before this U.S. Supreme Court case was decided in 1995. I think we were in federal court in 14 different jurisdictions all around the country. And in almost all of those cases, the court bought our argument that we're just the same as an ordinary family. And uh, we still argue that uh, if I were on the other side, I'd say, hey, what ordinary families full of all drunks and druggies in recovery? But we are. So basically by uh, U.S. law, you know, there's, not, there's, yeah. there's no argument about six people. Right. Uh, and to address it, I'll put this to our We'll definitely, we'll have an opportunity. Everybody's subject to zoning regulations. Nobody's yeah. above the law in that regard. At the same time, we have our provisions to address issues that come up. So that is one channel through which we are looking at these issues with respect to our Oxford House to make sure that where a reasonable accommodation is necessary, we take every step that is humanly possible to address that. Director, I have one question, Director. I'm Wait, sorry. I'm not done yet. I don't think you can. Well, we're talking about his provisions. I wanted to know where else in the district is there more than one house on one block. Sure, yes. Well. So I will say, having represented this ward in this community for four years, having worked uh, in Ward 4 in one capacity or another for 12 now, um, we have group homes and Oxford homes and all 20 four. And I know my residents. They're very welcoming people and they're very accepting. However, this is an extremely unique circumstance in that there is somewhere else in our ward that there are two Oxford houses located. So we're gonna take the density from perhaps zero to 20 overnight, right? And so that is the chief concern that I've heard from neighbors who are concerned is the level of density. Um, and respectfully, I would say, uh, that it's unfortunate that Oxford House decided to rent two homes in one block without any consideration for my constituents. Certainly, I think that everyone should have a place to live, and I support that. I have an alcoholic in my family. I want them to be able to recover safely. But I believe that we could have done better uh, and not put an undue burden on any one community. So their group homes, right down the street from where the Oxford homes are, I've never heard a peep from one neighbor about the group home, right? But this is a very unique circumstance. The density went from zero to 20 overnight. There are two homes directly across the street from each other. So that's what makes this case different. Thank you very much. I, I understand your concern. Um, one other thing, I just wanted to make a remark. I, I, I was looking up the different Oxford houses in the city. And I discovered one, there's one on 39th and Military, which is exactly a block from my house. And I've, I've walked a dog a million times past this house, and I've always thought it was a well-maintained house. The people in there were very polite. Actually, I thought it was a bunch of graduate students from AU or something. Right. So, uh, not a, I've been a commissioner for 12 years. I have not had one complaint from any of my constituents. So, any other complaints? No, that was my question. I was really pleased that the, there was a newspaper in Move up to the microphone, please. Or something like that. Move up to the microphone, please. Sir. Yes, there was a, a it may still be a newspaper called the Northwest Current. Yes, there is. Northwest area. 
And at the 10th anniversary of that house in Northampton, they had a huge article about how the house had improved and how the gardens were great and all this kind of stuff. So hopefully everybody who lives in an Oxford house takes pride in being part of upper middle class. And they can say upper middle class if they don't drink and they don't use drugs and change behavior. Okay. We do that. All right. There's 353 people, by the way, in the District of Columbia living in Oxford houses right at this moment. Okay. All right. Thank you. So we, have, we have no more commissioner questions, and we move on to the residents. Um, and at this point, there have been four residents who've signed up Andrew Bloom, Kim Hutchinson, Alan Silverly and uh, Crystal Wright. So first on the list is, um, I have Kim Hutchinson slash Andrew Bloom. Yes. Yes, so we're Kim. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, um, is our timer? Yes. Yeah. Three minutes. Okay. I'll talk fast. <laughs> um, I, uh, Move up to the microphone, you. please. Sorry. Um, I wanted to thank you all for uh, providing us this opportunity. And we come today as uh, concerned neighbors uh, because of uh, Oxford House being in our neighborhood as two houses. And I wanted to read um, kind of a statement of why we're here. The Neighbors of Moreland Street is established to advance the principles that all residents of our neighborhood should strive to contribute to the relationships, the community, respect, and safety of the area in which we live and call home. Pursuing this goal, we stipulate the following. We welcome individuals and families to our neighborhood without, with, without regard to race, religion, orientation, and social economic status. The long-standing diversity of our community is an important factor to why we all chose to live there. The embrace of people from all walks of life extend to those pursuing recovery from addiction. We all have family members who have, who have been in this situation. We also respect and support those people and organizations whose mission it is to assist those struggling with substance abuse. This is not our argument here today. As the problem is a citywide problem, so too should it be a citywide solution. Reasonable limitations should be imposed to ensure that no neighborhood, no one neighborhood, should bear a disproportionate burden to address this problem. The city and those institutions which serve the city should be transparent and respectful in how they operate. This includes accommodating both reasonable requests and the needs of not only those seeking recovery, but also those living around them who support the environment where they're going to get recovery. So we've put together some asks for you today, and in the limit of time, I'm not going to get into a lot of them, uh, but we will submit them to the um, ANC and to our <coughs> representatives later. Um, one of them is that we wanted to facilitate the questions that are being asked tonight and get more information um, after this meeting to be able to continue this conversation. Um, to just recommend the council engage in transparent activities. We want to set reasonable limits to the housing and the ward and to specific streets. Again, this is a very unique situation. and. Um, we, we would like to work with everyone involved with this. So I know Andrew has some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. I know I'm tall. Um, so I live on Oliver Street. I'm a next door neighbor of Kim. I'm here with my wife and we have two young children. I'm a lifetime Washingtonian, born and raised, grew up on Legation Street. And I speak on behalf of uh, Pretty much an entire neighborhood of concerned citizens and neighbors and since I mean I heard one version of events here which is sort of the utopian view and I think there were several key facts that were left out um, and and basically I wanted to go over some basic background and here's what we know of the two houses so I think it was said earlier uh, Department of Behavioral Health granted them Oxford House and 
$308,000 in March of 2019 to open three Oxford houses, including the two on Morton Street. And were those, I wanted to ask, was that a federal pass-through grant to DC? Okay. Um, and the funds, uh, like Mrs. Baffron said earlier, uh, are used in part to subsidize up to three months of residence rent. Um, these houses open unannounced and directly across from each other. Uh, they're slated to house 19 male recovering addicts. That's nine and a half people per house. Uh, we went through our neighborhood rosters and the average occupancy of the rest of the neighborhood is just under three people, 2.97. Nine and a half versus 2.97. Um, these houses are self-run by recovering addicts and there are zero counselors or support staff that live or work on site. Oxford House self-reports on its website, and I quote, 78% of Oxford House residents have served jail time. Oxford House self-reports on its website, and I quote, many Oxford House residents have co-occurring mental illness. Oxford House self-reports on its website that the average stay for residents is about a year. Extrapolating these averages over the initial five-year lease term, and it could be longer than five, five years, we can possibly expect a revolving door. It's not just going to be 19 people. We have to, they're going to come and go. And based on their averages, there could be 95 recovering addicts with 74 of those based on the averages, having served jail time, with many of them having mental illness. Now, a reasonable DC citizen would think if an entity, particularly one with DPH funding, is cramming houses full of recovering addicts that have criminal histories and mental illness, that the city would do anything okay. and everything in its power. I feel like we've been shafted on time, yeah, so. No, no. Right, no, and I'm not shafting you on the time, but I, I part of this, yes, is to make your statement, but if there are questions. I have questions well, at the end. Okay, I just wanted to make okay. sure. I know, I, Oxford, I know Oxford House has done this a thousand times and we're punching above our weight class right. and you know, Mr. Malloy's polish and it's no, our no, first no, but, time. I know, but we're not going to get into the debate. I just want to keep to the fact and not necessarily. I am. You can take I am. Time. Let him speak. Listen, I am going to let him speak and he's going to get his time and you're going to get hurt yours. But I just wanted to make sure that we keep the hearing and it's supposed to be combative that we Keep your questions and your facts and yes, your concerns. And so I am going to let him speak. If people are not finding this helpful, I... And so he's going to get his time back. I took one minute and you can get an additional minute. Now, a reasonable DC citizen would think, okay, if an entity, particularly one that's receiving DBH funding, is cramming houses full of recovering addicts that, with criminal histories and mental illness, that the city would do anything and everything in its power to make sure there are rules and regulations in place that protect and maximize the welfare of its citizens. You would think that would be the case, but our politicians in the city have failed us. Oxford House does not perform background criminal checks on its residents or applicants. DC does not require them to do so. Oxford House does not check the sex offender registry for its residents or applicants. DC does not require them to do so. According to Paul Stevens, the Oxford House regional manager overseeing these houses, I quote, there are no specific criminal convictions that would prohibit membership in an Oxford house. Simply put, these houses could potentially house convicted murderers, rapists, and or child molesters, and we would have no idea. Believe it or not, Oxford house residents, all recovering addicts, are encouraged but not required to attend counseling or treatment. DC does not require the residents to do so. Other than what is required by the criminal justice system, Oxford House residents are not required to be drug tested. DC does not require them to be tested. Furthermore, based on the cars we have seen parked in front of these houses and discussions with some residents, it appears many, if not all, of the house occupants are not DC yeah. residents, which begs the question, are we footing the bill and bearing the brunt of another state's problems and why? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bloom. Yeah, and yeah. have crystals three minutes? Okay. Yeah. 
Their needs, uh, we believe all these ingredients combine to directly jeopardize our safety and well-being, not to mention our property values, and we fail to see a single benefit that the Oxford houses provide to our neighborhood. I should say that I think it's unfair that uh, rush through this while everybody else has been given their time, but um, I'll go no, on. No, you're getting your three minutes. There. Thank you for the three minutes. There needs to be a responsible way of ensuring that recovering addicts get the help they need while holding Oxford House and similar sober living facilities that receive taxpayer money accountable. Applicants should be fully screened and vetted to weed out individuals who pose a clear and present danger to the neighborhood. Recovering addicts should be required to be in treatment and be tested for drugs and alcohol to ensure they are staying clean. We pose the following questions to Councilman Todd and other remaining members of the panel before us. Please affirmatively answer yes or no to each of the following questions. An individual is not considered disabled under the Fair Housing Act if he or she is a sex offender, currently using drugs or alcohol, or has been convicted of manufacturing and or distributing drugs. If Oxford House has not checked for sex offenders, perform background criminal checks, or perform drug testing, there may be residents of their houses who are not considered disabled under federal law. Yes or no? Would you support regulation or legislation that requires Oxford House and similar sober living houses as grantees of taxpayer money to perform criminal background checks and drug testing on its residents and applicants? You may not answer it right now. Yes or no? No. Right. Right, and then to ensure that you're properly answered, because you've written your questions, you're going to email them, um, I would suggest that we continue to have a detailed letter and response from both Council Member Todd as well as the agencies. I have somewhat process. similar questions. Can I just say them because they were Yeah, we're not going to be able to get through all of this tonight. We're going yes. to have to have this much. I just want to finish my statement. Yes, so I know you're getting them on record, but they are going to be properly yes. answered. So that was the first one regarding criminal background checks and drug testing. Yes or no? Would you support regulation that requires Oxford House and similar sober living houses as grantees of taxpayer money to perform sex offender registry checks of honest residents and applicants and ban them from its houses? Yes or no? Would you support regulation that requires all residents of Oxford houses and similar sober living facilities once again, as grantees of taxpayer money to attend substance abuse counseling and treatment. Yes or no, would you support regulation requiring that all residents entering city-funded Oxford houses be DC citizens? And lastly, yes or no, would you support regulation requiring that Oxford House and similar sober living facilities give neighborhoods reasonable notice prior to a home opening in their neighborhood? I can let you read these questions right now if you want to confer. No, no, but we're not going to, if you prefer, but we'll take this. Okay, you have to finish this up. Is, uh, is there anybody here that's in favor of Oxford House that wants to testify? What? Anyone here who's in favor of Oxford House moving into these two uh, houses that are in the neighborhood of these two houses right. wants to testify? Okay, so. Is, is yes. Any Oxford members? Are you in the house? Oxford yes. House tenants here? Okay. Yes. Pardon me? We have other residents. Yeah, we don't have time. We have another major issue we have to discuss yes. tonight. We, we have to, we have have to be out of here at 9.15. However, so. to, dis to discuss, because Sorry. we have gone, we had 45 minutes. Can I, and, 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 can I just say one Wait. I, think, I think it's really unfair to have this process has unfolded. I'll okay. borrow probably 45 minutes to get a sliver of that time. Oh, no. Oh, as I mentioned in, in the opening remarks, this is not, as we said, we're not, this is not the only opportunity. And as you know, I know you have your email um, chain as well that's been going. But this is not the only open public process. And, and let me back up. I am your grassroots commission representative. I am here to give you a voice and to support you. I support not only you, but we also have to be fair to the residents of Oxford House. Because I can remember, and the reason in the genesis of the Fair Housing Act 
because many of, and I, I can represent both sides. I'm here to represent both sides and we're going to give you a voice. This is not the only opportunity and I would think that you would also not want this to be the opportunity to continue the dialogue. You are on record with your questions. The agencies are here and Council Member Todd and the agencies have agreed with the ANC that we are going to continue this there, as we can see from tonight, perhaps we need for another additional meeting um, to discuss this and have this be the only issue on the agenda. Our ANC does have other issues and we have responded to your request because residents did ask for a meeting and to have this on the agenda. I have a question. So we have done going to be before July. Yeah, yes. Yes. August yes, we will year. ensure, and as we have, and I know many of you, this may be the first time it, at an ANC meeting, and many of you may not even know me, but you can believe that I'm a person of my word, and that I will represent the residents to the best of my ability, that you will have the opportunity, whether tonight you may have been cut off for a minute, we made sure you got it back, but this does not mean that you're not gonna get another opportunity to speak to the city and the council member regarding this issue. We're not trying to cut you off, we're not trying to put you under the rug. I live two doors down from this, and I walk past everything every day, so I have, while I have the same concerns that you may have, I also have to fairly represent our neighborhood and ensure that both sides of this issue are heard. And so at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to move on to our next issue and we can continue as residents to talk about this offline. And I will talk definitely to all of the Oxford House and the Moreland Street residents about the concerns and so will the council member. And we, we are going to continue. So we'll, we'll have to continue, I know you have questions. We'll continue this offline, we'll make sure we talk, and by no means is this the end, and we have heard your concerns, and I, and I can assure you that this will continue to be worked on. And so, yes, July 4th is on the agenda. You've heard from the agency that the ANC is commenting, and I'm going to recommend to our ANC that we continue this issue, and perhaps offline we continue to comment because other ANC haven't been. I, I, I just wanna say, it's been over a month where, where we've been trying to request the forum have this discussion and to wait over a month and for this to be it. No, Andrew, did you just Look, hear me? It is not the end. We're going to talk let's, offline. Let's calm down here. No, no, no. I, I'm, I'm no, you're, this, we've gone too long. Right, right. This is over. We're going to have another yeah. meeting before July 4th. You can call a special meeting if you want. It's up to you. Right. And that's, that's just what I just mentioned. Did everyone hear me say that I'm going to call a special meeting to just continue to discuss this and we're going to make sure and that this issue is um, resolved. And thank you all for continuing and coming. Thank you all for coming. Sorry it didn't go a little longer. Chris, please give everyone a second. Yeah, and, and, and thank you to my fellow commissioners for um, taking the time. Everybody, you need to take your conversations outside. Everybody outside. Come on, everybody, outside in the hallway, please. Everybody. You can't have a meeting if you're all talking. There's a lot of seats in the front now if you'd like to move up. <laughs> and thank you to the other residents for other issues. Thank you. Time, we're not going to do uh, the last two agenda items, which are a report on 
communication strategy and the status of the design contract for the community center. There's no, no new information, so we're not going to talk about that. So we now in uh, basically 9 o'clock, <clears throat> maybe a little after 9, we're going to do the last uh, agenda item, which is a presentation by the Director of Consumer Regulatory Affairs, Ernest Chapa, on the agency's recent enforcement and consumer protection enhancements. He said this will take about 10 minutes. And after that, we will talk about 5301 and 5303 Connecticut Avenue. Good evening again, everyone. I appreciate some of you staying uh, to hear a little bit about what's happening at DCRA that is uh, designed to protect your interest. Uh, I've been in the role for six and a half months, and uh, I've gone through over 45 listening sessions with our community members, politicians, neighbors, so I've heard it all. One of the things that consistently came out of those conversations is that there's a fundamental misunderstanding about the role of DCRA in the delivery of city services. So I'm hoping for the time we have together tonight, I may leave you with a couple of nuggets of uh, uh, truth and wisdom as well. Overall, we do everything from cutting grass, issuing business licenses, and giving building permits, and doing inspections and enforcement. The span of services we deliver is humongous. At the same time, we have over 575,000 people come through our building each year. We issue over 53,000 licenses. We provide economic contribution in billions. But there is still a disconnect between what residents expect and the services that the agency is delivering, in part because we are in an on-demand economy where you can push a button on your phone and see your driver come to you. So people have similar expectations of the bureaucracy. And as a result of that, there's this constant tension to make the agency more transparent, accountable, and uh, responsive, we've embarked on a number of measures. Uh, you can track our progress by going to bcravision2020.com. It has a clock that is counting down what we're going to do to finally transform the agency by the end of 2020, where we'll move all our services online and give you the ability to not only track any service request by receiving notifications throughout the process. We have a very aggressive schedule to finally change the way we create value. You have a series of handouts that I just want to quickly explain what that means and then end the conversation on uh, what is happening at our 5301 and 5303 Connecticut Avenue because that's very symptomatic of the disconnect between what people are looking for, what we funded, what we staff to do. Uh, the first is um, our on-demand customer relationship management. Uh, well, let's start with the charge, I see people looking at that. This lists out all the KPIs, key performance indicators, and the services we deliver. So for example, if you look towards the um, bottom, there's one called vacant building inspection. If you see a vacant building, a vacant lot, and you call us to do an inspection, our timeline is 38 business days. 38 business days. It's not the next day, the next hour. So that in itself tells you that the way the ABC is set up makes it challenging to meet the service expectations. When you have a vacant building that can have all um, has to be a magnet for crime, you want the government to do something right away. But our service level is the day business day. So that's something to put in context. Uh, more importantly, if you look at uh, the permit reviews, you're doing just fine. But areas where you see the red represent an opportunity for improvement for the agency. Secondly, we have um, a culture, not just at the CRA, but with our customers as well, where one issue, you see a thousand people getting more. Of course, I'm exaggerating with a thousand. But the idea is that one issue, you have a whole bunch of people getting involved trying to get an answer, and there's not a consistent response back to our customers. So we've put in place an on-demand customer relationship management model, which means whether you contact us by phone, email, Twitter, or in person, we will coordinate our response, get it to you, but we will resolve your issue in three business days. So that's a service level that we are guaranteeing to our customers. Now, whatever your issue or your concern, contact us through one of these channels. We will automatically acknowledge it within 24 hours, issue you a case tracking number so that you can follow what we are doing within that three business day uh, time frame. 
So far, we've dealt with over 5,000 of these cases, and I'm pleased to announce that we are doing just great in that area. So for you to live here today, you have to remember one thing. You have to become a customer of DCRA so I can get the services and get a streamlined response. Uh, the last thing that I want to mention is that in an effort to increase um, accountability and transparency also, we've launched, uh, we've relaunched a pilot database where you can get access to building permits, plans that have been filed for a particular property. And that is part of this idea to empower our residents, our customers, so that you know what's going on in their neighborhood. If somebody is going to build a two-foot story, a three-foot story, once we get the plans, we approve it, we make everything available online by default. So that's a resource that is available to you. And uh, the one piece that uh, has been mentioned in the agenda is streamlined enforcement. Enforcement is one area where we have to improve, and we've taken steps in that area, starting with the housing code violations. Historically, it took about 133 days from when we see a housing code violation for an enforcement action to be taken. We've cut that by a third, where now it's being taken care of in uh, 66 days. So we anticipate using the lessons learned to scale our approach to enforcement in other areas around illegal construction and a lot more. I'm not going to bore you the details, but I have one ask. Track our progress uh, by going to bcrabc2020.com, share your feedback so that we can help you and uh, make sure that uh, you feel safe in your neighborhoods and you feel that the city government is meeting your needs. Thank you. That ends the presentation. I can uh, talk about 5301, 5303, if that's appropriate for you. Uh, thank you, Director. Uh, Definitely welcome transparency in DC area. I, I do not find you easy, uh, an easy organization to uh, find my way around, <clears throat> get questions answered. Uh, I finally tapped into Inez over there. She's been very, she's been great. So uh, she's always pointed me in the right direction. But it took me a while to, to get there. So uh, anything you can do to make the process easier, I appreciate it. So uh, let me just make a statement about uh, 5301 and 5303 Connecticut Avenue. Uh, we're here to find a solution to these neighborhood eyesores. Uh, these have upset this community for over three years, over three years, 5301. A brief chronology, on March 2016, 5301 was demolished. The site was left strewn with rubble. This was three years and three months ago. This is what it looked like three years ago. This is exactly what it looks like today. There's no appreciable change whatsoever, despite all the things I've been hearing from DCRA or anybody else. Uh, 5303 was stripped of all of its salvageable architectural features, such as the columns and the moldings and anything that uh, the owner could sell on the market. And it was left as a wreck in a derelict state. This happened one year and seven months ago. This is really a crime. This thing has been sitting on Connecticut Avenue for over a year and a half. I mean, you guys should be embarrassed. The city, D.C. should be embarrassed that this should be allowed. People from Maryland drive by and see this, this, this wreck. And there's a number of others on Connecticut Avenue in similar condition. There's one down in Van Ness, another one on two buildings in Nebraska. This should not be, should not be allowed to continue. I, I, there's something wrong with D.C. government. This building's like this to sit around for a year and a half, despite constant neighborhood uh, on June 2018, a man exposed himself in 5303. He stood in that window on the second floor and banged on the glass when uh, school-aged girls went by and exposed himself. I mean, this was a year ago, and that building's still standing there. I mean, what in the world's going on? We wrote to the council member, the mayor's office, Chairman Mendelson, nothing's happened, DCRA. Uh, and on 2018, a good thing happened. 5303 was actually classified as blighted by DCRA, and now the, uh, the owner has, his taxes have gone up from 16,000, 6,000 a year to 75,000. So at least he's paying something, but it doesn't seem to have uh, goaded him into any action. Uh, there have been many letters, emails, and personal communications by neighbors in the AMC, with the mayor's office, Council Member Mendelson, Council Member Jay, DCRA, DCRA many times, nothing has happened. Uh, it's my understanding that the owners of the property are paying their if the owners of the property are paying their taxes, there's nothing DCRA can do to the building other than to secure it. And 
That's what I was told by DCRA. However, the owner of 5303 owes $127,000 in back taxes. Receive a notice of delinquency from the Office of Tax and Revenue, which means theoretically you can just go in there and tear it down and take that property away from it. Uh, so I don't know what it's going to take to make these eyesores go away, but you know, that, that's one thing I'm asking you. you know, we need to find out how we can do something about these two eyesores. Now, let me just say one other thing. Today, I guess the owner of the building got wind of this, and I, I finally got his email address. He has like three or four corporations that he, that he hides under. And he sent me a nice email. He says he wants to meet with me and talk about what he's going to do. And so I'm going to meet with him. So that's, that's a positive sign. But still, you know, three, three years and three months, and, and we're still living with this blight on the neighborhood. So I want to know what, what are you guys going to do? Thank you for that context. It's important to look at this uh, particular issue in the, uh, from a different angle. We can keep doing the same things that we've done over and over again and expect different results. It's just not going to work. Uh, the district has strong property rights. The government has no business going to take your property and do what it wants to with it. That's just the law. Understanding that constraint, there are a few facts that I want to put out. One is this idea that DCRA has not done anything. DCRA has done a lot, uh, and I can detail uh, what DCRA has done. But it is clear that the community wants a different solution. DCRA has been at that property, I believe, over 24 times over the last uh, couple of years. In fact, the first month that I started this job, one of the emails I got was about 5301 Connecticut Avenue. It was about a Saturday morning. I was driving over Military Road towards uh, George Avenue when my phone went off and I looked at it. And I said, hold on, I just drove past this property. So I turned around to look at what was happening there. Each time somebody complains, and in this case it was uh, about some guy exposing himself, we dispatched somebody there, not in weeks, not in the 38 business days that is our standard service level and what we are funded for. We sent some of them almost right away. The property was boarded up. It was secured. I even sent pictures to a resident uh, right in that moment. So we responded. But this can quickly become a whack a mouse or a whack a mole game. You board it up, you fix it up, somebody else goes, destroys it, and we go back over and over and over and over again. That's been the history. The city, and DCRA in particular, has placed special assessment on that property. Each time we go fix or abate a property, we place special uh, assessments on it. And we are not going to be paid that. We are not going to recoup our expenses until that property is sold. So if you are running a business and you are giving away stuff, and not recouping, there's going to be a point in time where you just don't have the financial resources to do the same. What we are looking at when it comes to 5301, 5303, the combination of the two, is purely a disconnect between what people are looking for and what the agency is set up for. Now, the owner, I believe there's been a change in ownership a couple of times also in this particular situation. So whenever we have to send a notice, the law requires us to send it to the owner of record and to wait a specific amount of time to see if the notice will be returned to us. If not, there's a different path we have to take. So there are just fundamental legal constraints in executing what the community is looking for. So one of the things I'm going to ask folks here, if you have some ideas on what else you'd like the city to do, I'll be willing to hear it out. By the end of the day, we will do the inspections, we will do abatement subject to funding availability and at the same time get our resources in line to get the property owners to do what is expected of them. It is currently under active construction. That means if there is debris, first the property owner is the person who should be fixing it before the city agency comes in. Thank you. Uh, first, any commissioners have questions? I see a few hands, and I would just ask that people go to the microphone, identify themselves, and so we can write down your name before what you said. Okay. First. Thank you, Director. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi folks, I'm Teddy Ann Galligan. I grew up in this neighborhood. I remember when this building was built. And we had problems with exhibitionists and then masturbating when I was a child. And I'm flipping fed up with it. And there is a moral imperative to this, this to what's going on now. It's not just a question of BCRA and regular boarding up. That's ineffective. We have a number of young girls, anything from late elementary to mid-high school, some of whom I know personally, some of whom are my neighbors, um, who have now been through a traumatic experience of remember for their life, and their families have been bothered, other families of mine. I have two daughters. We haven't had that particular experience, but we have to discuss this, deal with it at home. This is a moral issue. This is far beyond just, oh, we're going through bureaucratic steps. I spoke to, once I, on October 16th, I did some, um, research and I found the name and the phone number of the owner and I phoned him and we had a pretty friendly conversation and um, I was very blunt and he said he would consider getting or was talking about getting a, a camera we were discussing whether it would be better to have an obvious camera as a deterrent or as a more discreet camera as a method to catch these folks because this was going on not just there but when Sunrise was under construction buildings near there also down at 530 5103, Nebraska, uh, Connecticut, near Nebraska. So this is a neighborhood plague. Um, it's, our girls don't deserve it. We deserve more for the girls, because they hold up the sky. And um, he didn't do anything. There were continued incidents over this winter spring. I contacted him again in May, and I said, what's, you know, what's going on with the, with the sexual predatory behavior happening in your building, this criminal activity that you know about since October? Because in October, he told me he had no idea. I find that hard to believe, but he told me he had no, I, no idea. Is he here tonight? Commissioner, did Frumble, did he, he come? He didn't come tonight. If he wants to meet with me, I'll be with him. Um, I'll make him banana bread, but we're going to talk business. Um, but the thing is, is that he said in May 31st, he said, oh, we finally got the permit, and we've secured the building. I said, well, unless it's very recent, that doesn't make sense because there have been some recent events and he said that was within a day or so. So we're talking between October 16th and May 29th. He did nothing to prevent this criminal activity that is traumatizing and unfair and is another method to keep women down and to keep girls down. And we're not putting up with it. So the city needs to step up in a much more creative way. And we can, you know, I know, I think I know now where he lives, where his wife works. They have a multiple holdings. They could darn well do something fast. Question. I'm, I'm just wondering, have also in addition to looking at the agency, um, have the Metropolitan Police yes. monitor the area? Jacob, you want to put your name and address, please? Yeah. Uh, I'm Jake Sesker at the 3704 Jennifer Street. Um, I am Personally, not only have I personally been affected because, um, in fact, I, I believe it was my daughter in June of 2018 on the last day of school last year, on what should have been the beginning of her summer before middle school, had a man knock on the window of the upstairs of 5303 and masturbate in front of her and her friends. Um, and, uh, you know, they did exactly what they should do, which is run home. We called the police. The police eventually arrived. It was a little bit of Keystone Cops, honestly. Um, they all went to the front door, and we went to the back door. And then they sort of stood around and talked with me for a little while about how this guy always gets away every time they show up. Um, it isn't just the properties at 5301 and 5303, it is also the properties at 5101 and 5103. Um, rather ominously, in the window of 5103, which is near the corner of Nebraska and Connecticut, there's the, uh, the um, lid to the board game operation, um, which just sort of is like incredibly creepy um, when you know that somebody is actually going into that building Again, the same building, the same MO, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, roughly, occasionally 8 o'clock in the morning, to masturbate in front of girls, you know, teenagers, two teenage girls who are walking by, that they're like putting a child's board game in the window um, of the property is fairly creepy. Um, and this has also happened uh, roughly the same MO, as far as I can tell, at the property uh, directly across the street from Lafayette Elementary School, um, as well as another one up near Pleasant Sacrament. Um, my interactions with the police on this I have found to be incredibly frustrating. I understand as a local government employee myself, working for Montgomery County, uh, living in Ward 3, um, that everybody is siloed. Um, and so I appreciate your sort of commitment to your mission and, 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 and 
the fact that you're somewhat budget limited and you're thinking about the metrics for your department. But I have to tell you, I am not one of these citizens who wants to be instantaneously gratified, which is why I'm still here a year later talking to you about. Um, 38 days, um, you know, while there have been certain instances in which BCRA has been very responsive, um, including I think the one that you mentioned earlier, there have been other instances in which BCRA has never called me. Um, there certainly are issues that implicate the intersection between the, the jurisdictions of various different government departments where there seems to be no communication whatsoever. Um, you know, when the police are responding to something that is happening after school in a neighborhood that is full of children, that involves children and somebody who is engaging in like serial predatory behavior, it would seem like, say, for example, someone might notify the schools that are nearby. That didn't happen. It's quite seen, for example, that someone would notify the uh, licensed daycares, one of which is about 20 feet away, and another of which is across. I that. I would have been fine to know how much. So those are a couple of my comments, and welcome. But we would like something done with those properties, and you need to find them bigger. And that needs to be done to help the whole city. If the whole city is in this problem, that the developer and leave eyesores that's open for pedophiles, eyesores for anything, then it's not high enough. Thank you. Uh, does anybody else want to comment? Do you want to respond? Okay, sir. Okay. Sure. Thank you, Nancy. Very nice to meet you. Uh, it's also a uh, great. Uh, a few things uh, to respond specifically. One, as much as uh, this property's history predates me, it's important for me uh, leading the organization now for us to find ways to move the community forward, uh, in spite of the legacy of the past. Uh, whether it happened five years ago, two years ago, it doesn't matter. Right now, it is a situation that I have to take care of. So that is what we are focused on. Coming back to your questions around the uh, taxes, uh, both properties are being taxed at the appropriate rate, and that is a fact. 5301 is taxed as a vacant lot, and 5303 is being taxed at the lighter rate. DCRA's uh, focus is on the classification. The Office of Tax Revenue handles taxation. So as we speak, both properties are facing the appropriate level of taxes. But as our commission, uh, Commissioner uh, Chris mentioned, there's a whole bunch that is owed on our other property as well. So to trigger higher tax rates, there's only so much you can do until it escalates to a point where they said, uh, this is going to be like a tax sale. And uh, we're making sure that we follow the process. And in the meantime, we'll be happy to look into alternative solutions, including finding a way to have conversations with the owner. Because, I mean, there's a limit to every law. Uh, you can't force people to do everything. This is not sort of like the Soviet Union, as I like to tell uh, my staff sometimes. So we have to explore a different solution so we can have a problem. Uh, and I keep doing the same thing in the past. Uh, one question. What is the developer's plan for this property? I'll have to check. Um, answer that. I've seen the drawings. Uh, there's a building permit and a demolition permit dated February. So if he says it just, you just got the permit, it's not, that's not true. You got, you got the permit in February. Okay, that's the date of the permit. Uh, it's a 19 story, a 19 unit, five story apartment building. Uh, it's got. It's, it's one building on both lots. It's going to kind of look like the one at 5309. It's got very, very tall ceilings, which is kind of odd, but I guess he thinks it's a, make, it makes it loss. The floor plans are very tight. But uh, I checked the uh, zoning and I checked the parking, and you know he's he's doing it by the book. So uh, you know I think we have to come before the ANC at some point to get those. When he has to come before the ANC, if he needs an exception. Or variance, so he does not have to pay uh, before the ANC. Does he nope. have to pay up the back taxes before he can start? I guess so. I'm not an expert on taxes, but I, mm -hmm. yes, he has to pay the tax. According to the notice that I have, he has to pay the taxes by May 31st, which is coming and gone. But I, 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 you know, I've been doing some looking around. I looked at 5101 and 5103, and they have the same issue. And they had it twice, and then they paid the taxes off. So I think what the game is, the developer is playing, is he's trying to make as much money as he can and spend as low as he can. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. You're the last one? Okay. One more. Uh, my name is Michelle Wallen. I live at 3715 Jennifer Street. And I just want to give you just a brief history just so you know what a bad actor this guy is. Mm. Well, I guess it's changed somewhat, but um, apparently we believe the real estate company that was initially involved is still involved. Um, they did not have a proper permit to do a demolition. Your office um, went ahead and approved a permit that was not a raised permit, thinking that they were not going to raise the property, which they immediately did. Um, that didn't get cleared up until I went down. I had the plans, showed it to the supervisor, the guy who went ahead and gave them the non-raised permit, and he said, oh no, this was a raise. He shouldn't have issued that permit. But anyway, they went ahead and raised it without a proper permit. More importantly, uh, one of my neighbors has seen them in their construction, the guys that were demolishing the building. And as someone, as Nancy noted, they didn't do anything about the hazardous material. We made several phone calls. DCR, DCRA completely ignored us. Mary Chase office ignored us. Finally, someone who had some in with the agencies came along, saw what was happening, and he was able to get DCRA to send out people to, you know, make sure they did the hazardous removal properly. While they were demolishing 5301, they damned, okay, first of all, they were supposed to get written permission from the owner of 5303. She was in New York, she rents out that house. They forged her signature, okay? Like, to me, that is a very horrible thing to do. Secondly, they damaged her house while they were demolishing it. And that's why she ended up selling. She tried to sue them, the case was in litigation for a bit, but she just couldn't afford to keep it up. So they offered her a million dollars, and it was like, well, the property's you know, damaged now. So she went ahead and sold it, though initially she wanted to keep that property for her son, eventually. So these are the kind of people we're dealing with. And one thing, I'm very concerned if they ever do go into 5303, to make sure that any of the hazardous removal is done properly from the beginning, because we had a lot of hazardous removal done improperly before the inspectors finally came out. So if you could let us know what we can do, if PCRA can be watching this. Because like I said, there's a daycare two doors down, another school across the street, and we're all here. And secondly, this is a little off topic for you, but to the AMC, um, parking is extraordinarily difficult on our street in the evenings. And if you get a 19 unit building in with four parking spaces, it is going to be absolutely horrible. Jocelyn, 3700 block, there's no parking on Jocelyn, basically. Um, so we're, I don't know what we can do, but like I said, parking is already extraordinarily difficult at night, and we just won't be able to absorb you know, this number of units uh, with just four parking spaces. Unfortunately, the parking is by code. So it's nothing to do about Anybody else? Yeah. Last question. <clears throat> we have to wrap up. I'm Charles Muscarello, 373 in Jennifer Street. Uh, the one problem that I see, the properties have never been properly secured. Somebody can walk up the front steps of 5303 and they have access to the hazard, to whatever. The garage is open. It was never a garage with a door. And kids go after school and smoke marijuana. We have told them to leave, and they said, it's legal to smoke marijuana in the city. And I said, why don't you smoke it in your own backyard? Oh, no. Okay. So uh, when the so they can't smoke it if they're under 18, legally. Under 21. Oh, 21, okay. Well, these are young, you know, high school. I don't know what <laughs> And when the inspector came out, the fourth time that somebody broke into the house and actually broke the glass door and got in through the basement, I said, why don't you board up the garage? Because they don't have access, access to it. They just looked at me and went off. I mean, you're always going to have that problem. There's graffiti all over the wall now and not very nice words that they put up. And kids are being, walking in the alley from the daycare, and you know, it's, it's just a disaster. And the yard is, they cleaned it up, and they piled all the 
rubble on the other side of the very simple picture. Debris that was in the yard. And they've got to clean out all that stuff before they can even start to build. And I don't know why they don't do it. Two quick things. Uh, one, again, I think this is um, a good reminder that um, anybody wanting to get in touch with the CRA, uh, if you don't follow this process, it becomes very difficult for us to coordinate a response, whether it's by phone, email, Twitter. It's important for every inquiry to be acknowledged. Uh, oh, it's accountable to the three business day time frame. So while I can't speak to the past, I can only encourage everybody to help us move forward with the future. Uh, secondly, when a property is under construction, active construction to some degree, uh, there are certain things that are the, the responsibility of the owner. You cannot seal a property off completely. It's actually a safety risk because there has to be a way for traffic in and out and the end of construction is sort of like close the gate. Uh, the trash and the debris uh, on that property doing an active construction is a responsibility of the article. Right. Yeah. That said, whenever there's continuing complaints, we have to follow the law and abate and try to uh, um, impose special needs or assessments on the private one. That is a status quo solution. But again, we have to put our heads together to figure out what we can do collectively and how the city can be of assistance. So I look forward to continuing that relationship. Yeah, Director, one thing, that, that is not an active construction site. It has not been an active construction site for a year and a half. What, what the developer is doing is gaining. I'm an architect, so I know a lot about this stuff. He goes, up, he goes on the property, he moves a stack of bricks from one side of the yard to the other, and, 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 and that's all he does. And, and he's tricked your inspectors a number of times, because I get these notes from DCR, this is an active construction site. It's not an active construction site. There's nothing been done. I mean, you can look at the pictures. They're exactly the same. So it's, you know, it's not. So anyway, we have to go. We have one more question. And one more comment. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm Michael Gallant. I live on uh, 5132 Nebraska Avenue, um, down the street from 5101 and 5103, which are in a similar condition to the 5300 block properties you've been talking about. The issue really is that your methods for securing these properties are worthless. I mean, over the last two years, uh, my neighbors and I have called. We've had responses from PCRA. They come out, they do what they have to do. NPD comes out in its own time. Um, but these properties are not secure. Um, you, you can walk up to any of those buildings. The windows are ajar because they're boarded from the inside. You can, with your hands, you can push those boards in and gain access to those homes. So they're not properly secured. And I'm flabbergasted that two years later that the game board box cover is still in the window of that property at 5103. Um, I mean, it's astonishing. And so, I mean, DCRA has got to look at how do you properly secure a property to, to bar access. And, you know, I don't really want to hear about active, even the most expansive definition of an active construction site does not address these properties. They are vacant, derelict, and abandoned. There is no work on them, not for years. Final words? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, again, um, I'm here to figure out how we can move forward. I understand the frustration. I do. I have little kids too. So let's put the first, let's look at things on a human level. But to suggest in any way that the city is not securing property properly, uh, I'm not so sure. Uh, that is the accurate of portraying the At the end of the day, at the end of the day, unless you absolutely demolish the building, okay. even if you put uh, fiberglass, uh, the most like uh, expensive material, humans are uh, geniuses. They'll figure out ways to get around. So we can dwell on the past and talk about how many times this area has been there. Uh, or figure out alternative solutions. And that is a conversation I yes. want to have in the interest of moving forward. I appreciate the comments, and I appreciate the interest, and I understand the frustration. 
I'm dwelling on the past is not a solution. So I look forward to working with you all. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we have to stop. It's only one person that hasn't spoken yet. And you know something to say. Yeah. yeah. And that's it. And then we're done. Name and address, please. I'll be very fast. I'm Jordan Meissner at 3719 Jennifer. And I, I just wonder, um, as a legal matter, I, I work in real estate, and a lot of times you have these situations where you can't make it work. Um, and you have to, so I'm just wanting, there's always a mechanism in the agreement where if something goes on long enough, there's a trigger, there's arbitration, or there's some kind of thing to break the log jam. So I'm just wondering, what is that mechanism? Is it simply a tax sale? They just have to not pay their taxes for long enough, and that's when something changes? Or is there something else legal where after a number of years, number of violations, number of this, number of that, you can eventually break the log jam? And because someone would buy that property and develop it, just probably not the price that this guy paid, which is why he's not selling it. So. A number of tools uh, not uh, limited to tax sale. Uh, one also is uh, exceeding the threshold of uh, stop work orders. Uh, another also is uh, identifying the developer who's uh, had like a history of uh, not uh, following the law. And when the appropriate threshold is uh, exceeded, they can be denied future building permits. So there are a number of tools in place. Uh, but from what I've seen so far, agent or the developer has not exceeded that. So even if you take it to court, there are still some due process and consideration that have to take place. As Commissioner mentioned, at some point, they pay their back taxes, you know, and they come into our uh, compliance. And then there's certain pattern of emergence. So some of the areas where we are looking to strengthen the enforcement is putting in place a rating system. Uh, so every developer, contractor, architect, who comes across the agency in some way is going to be objectively rated. So that on subsequent projects, uh, they have a different lane because of the historical uh, uh, risk profile. So we can address some of the issues. We are also having our conversations with uh, Mr. Resini's office with regard to coordinating enforcement actions. We also have conversations with uh, the Metropolitan Police Department on ways to take uh, actions because we don't have arrest powers. Uh, we also have a conversation with our sister agencies about data sharing so that when there's a need to respond to a situation, no single agency is responding to it simply from their point of view. But they have access to critical data across the entire ecosystem so that we can be more effective. You know, we have to, I, I'm sorry, we're done because we're out of time. Uh, we have to leave this building. By, you know, Shortly, or we're going to get thrown out. So, Director, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, what, <clears throat> what, I think the next steps here, I'm going to try to write up a resolution expressing some of the thoughts that came through here for everybody to look at. I appreciate you. So, this won't be a final, this will be a rough, rough draft. Maybe we can come up with a resolution in uh, about two weeks. Appreciate you, everybody, coming out. <clears throat> Sorry this is taking so long. Uh, very elusive to the helper. And, uh, I'm going to meet with him, believe it or not. I have a phone conversation with him tomorrow, so we'll, we'll see what happens. And, and then uh, I'm just also wondering, since the uh, MPD representative is here tonight, can you email him or call him about yeah, I'll send him going back like, tomorrow and yeah. having regular... Yeah. We'll talk to him. To, I'll send him something. Well, I can be part of the resolution. Yeah, it's going to be all the Mission business the minutes of May 13, 2019. We need to uh, approve the minutes. Anybody second? All, all in favor? Dan. 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 Okay, minutes are approved, checks.
Chandra. As reported by Alan and Stephanie, we have a one check for $199.99 um, for GoDaddy Security Certificate. And that is it. Okay, you all in favor? <laughs> yeah, we do. Sure, we do. Wait, who uh, raised their hands? Did you guys raise your hands? We voted. We voted, okay. Okay, all right. <laughs> Okay, lastly, items for June 24th may include, and they may not include, report and recommendations from the task force in developing a communication strategy for the commission, and I'm hoping to have some information, or information on the Chetty Chase Community Center. Uh, also, a resolution for... Actually, that remains to be seen. But we will have uh, a resolution on the 301 to um, Moreland Street will have a separate meeting, but I am thinking with the input of commissioners, we may want to put an official resolution as to what our thoughts are on this issue, but that's tentative. Um, so I, I will talk with them after the meeting, but tentatively. Okay, well done.